Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is James Waite. Welcome, James. Thank you, Rick. Not to be confused with Dennis Waite, who's a, a Brit who also talks about non-duality. James lives in Berkeley, California. No relation to Dennis, uh, other than on the non-dual level. And uh, I met James at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California, and uh, he sent me a book, Fading in the Light, Non-Duality Insights on Living and Dying. And it was kind of timely, James, that you know, I read this book this week um, because, oh, there's a subtitle here, Aging in Peace Happens When We Rest in the Light of Aware Living. It's timely that I read the book this week because um, two good friends of mine died last weekend, unrelated to one another, uh, one from cancer, one from heart problems. And I, I went and meditated with uh, the body of the, the, the one, one of the friends, uh, which a, a number of people were doing. He was sort of laid in repose. And it was a very interesting experience. I, I kind of kind of realized why yogis are, they go and meditate in cremation grounds and all, and why you see, you know, that famous Rembrandt of the, of the monk looking at a skull, you know. And um, there's, there's something about the experience that, uh, maybe we can talk about it during the interview, but there, it stirred up some insights and feelings, you know, that I found rather profound. Yeah, but let's talk about you. <laughs> well, uh, living yet dying, uh, in, you know, death is one of those things that for me has been a very powerful um, movement. And I, I've been alarmed at how... Um, at how unwilling I've been to live. Hmm. All okay. of your life, or what? Well, I I would say somewhat afraid. Um, not not greatly, but just in an abiding way. There was a fair bit of fear there, Rick. I mm. think that um, started out, and I think it kind of motivated me to explore things deeply. Yeah. There's that line from Old Man River, I think it was something like, I can't stand living, but I'm afraid of dying. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so I mean, that's obviously the goad for many people, the, the kind of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Um, Force us or, or goad us to into looking to some deeper meaning. Yes, I think that's exactly what happens. I love this uh, entree of your. Is it the dog or the cat? That and that was a dog. Yeah, I know you have both. I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they come and go during the interviews. Yes, that's lovely. That's yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I don't. At a certain period after my, um, I'll call it, waking up event, I mean, you know, I, it's funny each time I refer to it now because it was, to set it in time, it was in October of 2006. Mm -hmm. And I I was at an Ajashanti sat saying, and he said something I still don't know. And, and in a way, everything stopped. And... Uh, and there was a, a timeless recognition, which can't even be described. Mm -hmm. And um, other than to say that there was a, in my case, there was a kind of a brilliant white flash. Mm. It's, nothing else can I say about it, because there's no way it can be described. It's truly ineffable. But in any case, there was with that recognition gradually uh, a recognition that all fear of death had disappeared mm. and in about two years fo following that I was kind of in a long phase where I was more or less in the absolute it was just kind of Experience where I had to function. I had also physical problems. I moved, um, and um, a whole number of things occurred to produce a reduction or 
somehow take away whatever else I had left in my uh, ego that had some investment in being spiritual. Hmm. So yeah. in other words, you had this awakening in, in the Adyashanti meeting and then you went through a period of adjustment for several years afterwards where a lot of house cleaning took place. Is that what you're saying? A wrecking bar. Yeah. <laughs> or a wrecking ball, I, uh, in a way. I mean, not that many things hadn't already happened because I had a 22-year... Uh, period in a um, esoteric school based on the teachings of Gurdjieff and Ospensky, mm -hmm. and um, it was an international um, group, and I had been pretty active in it and committed to it and taught in it and traveled worldwide and mm. lived, uh, in fact, for eight years in Europe, in uh, Venice and London and Greece, etc. Nice. So you were really this. dedicated to it. Yeah. I really was, yes, mm -hmm. and and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing, something I would never have been able to do, uh, to live a, a life that was so focused on uh, beauty and art. Mm -hmm. um, it appealed to me greatly because I have an arts background, mm. um, and so I was able to live abroad. In that group, um, was there an emphasis on kind of self-remembrance throughout the day, uh, mm. keep kind of checking in, checking in, checking in. That's right. Uh, yeah. The reason I ask is that, um, you know, Maharshi, Maharshi Yogi used to tell a story about when he first came to the West and he was doing meetings in Europe. People would come and they would talk in a halting kind of way yeah. Like that, and and you know after all after a while he said what's going on you know why why are you speaking that way and they said well we were taught to remember the self you know and so at, between each word we check back and remember the self and and you know he said well why can't you speak fluently and they said well because we're doing this he said well no 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 he said that's not the way the self is lived not not through some kind of mental gymnastics it's it, it's just, it gets established and then you know normal life goes on but it doesn't it's not a sort of an a continuous act of will that is, so so well, did you go through something like that yourself oh yes yes and and in, <laughs> I, I was in i was searching for the truth i mm -hmm. i had not had any sense of life having something more till i was maybe 38 or so mm -hmm. and um and then i was i had a number of experiences where i lost uh two businesses um, a marriage, um, a number of collapses. This is so I've had a series of collapses, yeah. you know, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. But this was the sort of beginning catalyst event of of a uh, in the ashes, wondering what's all, what's this all about? What's the truth here? So I started out in search of the truth, and I came across a book in a bookstore after taking some gestalt work and stuff like that um, that it was called um, it was by a man named Nicole it was called um, Commentaries on the Teachings of Gurdjieff and Ospensky and it was a five volume set. And, and by the time I found that I, I literally wept in the bookstore mm. And I kissed this book after I had read a little bit. I wow. This is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I was very earnest. Mm. And it's never left me, that earnestness, since it was whatever incubated in a way, because it didn't come from me. It was something that just started when it needed to, I, the way I see it now. Your earnestness. Earnestness. Uh, yeah. in, truth, in a spiritual way, because bo before then I was very success-driven, material driven I was an advertising agency guy um, copywriter um, very Mad much into the material madman <laughs> madman exactly in right. fact I recognized that whole series I've watched yeah. with my wife and I recognized that was kind of my life yeah, yeah. very much aspects of it mm -hmm. so um, when I went on search of the truth and I found that book that started me in a certain direction I read for 
couple of years maybe and got more and more earnest and one day I found a bookmark in another book but related to Gurdjieff and Ospansky you know he has Ospansky wrote several books and, and uh, to me that was just my the tune I needed to hear you know so I um, found this bookmark and it was for um, uh, a group which I probably will not mention because I don't see any particular value in it um, I, I it has value for people and it was certainly valuable for me for 22 years so I am, am very thankful that that in some way uh, it I went that I was taken in that direction on the other hand now in sort of hindsight I could have saved quote myself a long way home but it's never that way for us. Is no. It? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and one of the key tenets of this school that I joined was self remember uh, as it was called. And, and it was um, based on Gurdjieff and Spensky. It right? was, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And on an interpretation of them with, I see. Um, that I wonder now whether how close we were or whatever. But so th there's so there's more than one group or or you know collection of people that uh, affiliate with Gurdjieff. There's oh yes, okay. worldwide, and and they had their time and period. Maybe maybe not sort of going strong the way it used to, but um, the, the school that I belong to is still mm -hmm. uh, going. Going fairly strong, it still has, uh, you know, maybe two thousand people in it or so. Whereas right. when I was in it, it had like six thousand. Mm -hmm. I would say. Okay, so you did that for twenty-two years. Yes, and, and did you whole... find that that self-remembrance actually um, was an encumbrance in a way? Did it make you less efficient in activity to always be sort of self-remembering and yet trying to run a business or whatever? Y yes, mm -hmm. yes. If you practiced it. Um, it was one of um, remembering yourself while in the middle of talking and while doing things and 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 being intentional to reach for a glass with yeah. with you know I'm here uh, reaching for a glass a lot of um, what I see now as a spiritual ego mm -hmm. um, a way to do something to become something in time. Yeah, and I was looking for that at the time. I mean, show me, tell me, you know. And I wanted structure. I wanted a method. I think and the motivation is sincere, but I think that sort of practice is really inefficient. And to to, to just to express my own opinion here, uh, it's it's not necessary. It divides the mind, you know, and. Um, <laughs> It kind of creates a strain, I would say, to constantly be trying to do one thing and another at the same time. It, it you know, diminishes efficiency and activity, and it's in a way could actually be a spiritual impediment. But I think that the the sincerity and the earnestness that you brought to it certainly, and that I'm sure many people do. Um, carries them forward regardless of the, of the uh, ineffectiveness of the practice. Yeah. Yes. It it yeah, I don't know what the word is forward uh you know in a sense if because in a way now I see that there was never any place to go and there was no forward really, you know, there was in my mind uh, yeah. an idea of getting somewhere. Um and uh it gave me a a forum and 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 colleagues and and we we had wonderful dinners and beautiful experiences and uh, I call it um, uh, how would I call it now I, I'm going for a word here um, well it was a very elegant period if mm -hmm. the Gatsby is popular now I was living the Gatsby only in a spiritual uh -huh. realm um, and uh, that suited me <laughs> Nice. In some way, yes. So I'm very thankful. Yet, when it came time to leave, it was very obvious that this was no longer um, producing yeah. anything worthwhile for me. Right. You hatched out of that incubator. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And right. and I and of course and I, then when I say that everything is in hindsight and in the story, mm -hmm. and it's so unreal, you know, a story about our life, uh, right. just a fabrication from the the beginning. So I, I I look at it with a little compassion. Yeah, I mean anything can be dis and everything can be dismissed as a story, you know. But that's the case. Life is full of stories, and and um, you know if we want to assign causality to things, then you know we can. I don't know whether which is the cart and which is the horse. I mean it seems that some a lot of times people are who are ardent spiritual seekers uh, end up having realization. On the other hand, you could say, well, they were ardent spiritual seekers because this realization was was hatching, was dawning, and and their ardency, their their you know earnestness was just symptomatic of of this uh, you know chick that was about to break out of the egg. That, that that's why they felt that way. So I don't know what is cause and what is effect, but there does seem to be a correlation. Yes, it's curious, isn't it, uh, yeah. to to talk about these things because we. I recognize that there, there's the life of James um, and, and the whole... I mean, I was Jim before I joined the school. Then I became James. Oh, very. More formal. Because, <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, and, and many members in the school changed their last name to a more, you know, like Lancaster or oh, brother. Uh, an, an English kind of name mm -hmm. because that was what the teacher... Asked some to do. That was a little before my time. But Were you Sir James by any chance? No, no, no. But <laughs> hey, it's happening right now. I hear of, in, of one in, of the people that died has been made Sir. Uh, that's funny. Uh, so you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interest, nice. Interesting. Um, okay, so you're just plain old James, and um, and you stuck with the James. So. Uh, so after you left this 22-year association, uh, what, is that, what year does that bring us up to? 2006. Oh, right yeah. around the time when you went to see Adya. Yeah, yeah. Within months, some okay. old friends from the same fellowship um, had mentioned something about Adya Shanti. Um, they thought they might go on Saturday. He was speaking here in, uh, in Berkeley in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I said, well, if you go, maybe I'll go along. Um, and we debated that morning whether to even go. We thought, go hiking or there? Oh, well, let's go see Aja. And um, actually, I, it wasn't necessarily, I'm not sure, that morning, but I saw him maybe two or three times in the next three months. Mm -hmm. And at one of those, um, this particular event occurred. Yeah. I wasn't asking for it. I wasn't looking for it. It wasn't in any way, as we know, deserved or earned or, you know. I mean, I say that because honestly, I, if anything, I could say that I had exhausted for myself all the possibilities and I'd given up the search. And it was in that giving up that the finding occurred, mm -hmm. and and we read about this, but uh, that's similar to what happened to Aja himself. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't do these things. I mean, because I've been doing, you know, in a sense of making, I think, pretty big efforts. Yeah. Efforts to to remember myself, etc. Um, and I had some wonderful states along the way. Um, which is beautiful and that, but like I would define a state as something that comes and goes. Right. Um, and and beautiful as it may be, you can't live there. Right. Uh, Where uh, contrast that with your experience now? Yes, yes. It's like right now, as I said to somebody the other day, um, the light is on. Mm -hmm. It's like. It's not. It's on twenty four seven. Right. Um, it's like a switch was thrown, and and there is a profound. I use that word with a lot of respect. Um, a profound sense of being. It's subtle. Mm -hmm. It's gentle. Its nature is love. 
Beautiful. Yeah. When you say it's on 24-7, um, how about like at 3 in the morning when you're snoring like a sailor? Is there some light on then, metaphorically yes. speaking? Yes. Beautiful. Yes. Cool. Yes, it just doesn't, I mean, it can't go away because how could it? Right. What would happen to the universe if it did? <laughs> exactly, you know. <laughs> yeah. If anything really died, I mean, our bodies and our minds die, and, and life obviously in a cellular form and in time and space uh, has its time and space. But, you know, that which is forever or uh, infinite or whatever that which we are, how could it go away, you know? So there's that recognition that stays. Yeah, that's nice. Um, there are a number of writings about that, and not all the spiritual teachers and speakers um, address it, but there are a number of you know traditional and contemporary accounts of the fact that you know when one is really awake, then that is 24/7, and, and it, it remains through the depth of deep sleep. Um, there was a there was an Indian saint named Tatwala Baba. I, I sort of paraphrased him a minute ago. Someone asked him if he slept. You know, and they meant it in the in the sense of, you know, do you close your eyes and go to sleep at night? And he said, what would happen to the universe if I slept? And of course, his body slept. Uh, bodies have to do that. But, you know, he went on to elaborate how, you know, that which I am, you know, is the foundation of everything. And if that, that, that couldn't sleep, but if it were to, then the foundation would be pulled out from under, there would be no universe. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes I, I, that, uh, I, I can't really think about it, or I have no, no particular, I would say, grasp. My writing is an exploration of it on my blog, mm -hmm. um, my my book or books, whatever. All they are is a is a um, is a continuous discovering of uh, this of of reality mm -hmm. and a probing and a and a curiosity. I love what Alice said in Wonderland. I, it gets curiouser Curious. and curiouser. That is great. And I like that. That suits me. There are a lot of nice little bits in, in your book. In fact, you know, when I read people's books, I, I sort, of, sort of wish it could, I could do a week-long interview where we actually read a paragraph, talk about it, read a paragraph, talk about it. <laughs> but Interesting. That would be fun. But yeah. um, not very practical. But uh, there was, here's one thing that jumped out at me. You said... Um, not only do we open, but we continue for the rest of our life opening, opening to new undreamed realms where we may come to see that our thoughts, words, and actions are not the whole of reality, that they're an expression of the infinite nature of source or spirit. Um, so I like that opening and opening to new undreamed realms. Mm -hmm. And it also reminds me of something Adyashanti said. Uh, I've quoted in a couple of interviews. He, he said... Um, even now with me, the mystery is just beginning, always still beginning. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, and I consider him a very advanced soul, you know. But it's it's, it's sweet and and beautiful to hear him say that. That it's like always a fresh horizon, kind of that you're exploring. Yes, yes. And Krishna Murti would call it a young mind, always having a young mind. Mm -hmm. Because, well, the mind itself being being staked in memory and, and the past, it, it's. Um, it, it might also be what the Zen people mean by beginner's mind. You know, yes. when, when they say that, I always used to think of that as well. You're just a neophyte. You're a beginner. That's beginner's mind. But I think maybe they were referring to some very profound, you know, state where you're always in a state of beginner's mind. It's uh, it's a uh, occupational hazard of aware living. <laughs> to to um, to not know what's going to happen, mm. and to occasionally have the uh, mind suggest or get a little bit concerned, like about what's going to happen, even though there's a deep knowing that all we do is that we we exist in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. It's never been otherwise. Mm. There's a deep understanding of of that, but. Still, the mind can kind of get a little agitated and uh, want to know. 
I guess that, that's what mines do, I guess. Yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> it's one of the they, things they do. Yeah, yeah. They plan and, and, and generally right. manipulate, and, and the ego's whole function is to manipulate uh, for um, outcomes that are uh, desirable. And yeah. Avoid those that are not. You know. And wouldn't you say that kind of having an ego of some sort is necess- is a functional faculty that gets us through life? I mean, absolutely. It's like you know your your vision or your sense of smell or your your hands or something. It's just a faculty, but it it kind of usurps its authority and and begins to think that it's running the show, yeah. much much more than it actually possibly could. Yes, yes. Our, the identity rests there, and that's where the, I'll say, error, if you will, occurs. Is is that there's a an innocent misplacement of identity into this egoic being mm-hmm. or egoic structure. Mm. As children, I remember taking that on. I remember, as a child, just um, uh, looking around me. Maybe I'd be eight years of age or so, maybe ten. Um, and um, wondering about the world and and like wanting to be liked and respected, mm-hmm. so I would check out what people were doing around me that got that, and I would say, oh, I'll take some of this and I'll take some of that, and I'll, I mean, I even wore certain clothes because, of course, at school and high school or later on. Um, I got, uh, you know, comments and respect and all the things that I thought I needed. Oh, sure, we all do that. Especially as we're, you know, going into adolescence, there's this acute kind of identity awareness, you know, of do, am I cool, how do I look, you know, is my hair is my hair getting good in the back, to quote the mother's of invention. Uh, you know, there's this sort mm-hmm. of identification mm-hmm. with the persona. Now, would you say that that's kind of a, a necessary growth stage, that you, you kind of have to build up an ego before you can dismantle mm-hmm. it or before, before you can... In other words, you have to have a solid, healthy kind of identity structure before you can transcend that. Yes, yes, it, it seems that way, and I think the key would be if you're fortunate enough to have a healthy ego structure there, uh, by healthy, not too neurotic, you know, not psychotic, not, you know, and and I was fortunate that my parents uh, were quiet and simple, sort of working people, um, not a lot of um, dreams or ambitions either in their own life or for me, mm-hmm. so they didn't push me hard other than my mother was a born-again Christian <laughs> uh, for 50 years, uh. and um, you know that can be a, quite a burden for uh, my twin brother and I used to be marched off to church three times a week. Oh God, I thought I had it bad having to go once a week, and my mother wasn't born again, she just thought it would be good for us, but it, like, it really ruined my Sundays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It ruined my Sundays, and we lived at one time right across from the schoolyard. Mm. And um, I would be um, nose pressed to the window, kind of, you know, that idea, looking, watching my friends across the street playing in the schoolyard all day Sunday, and I, I couldn't go out. Yeah. So yeah, I grew up to hate that God. <laughs> <laughs> God's no fun. <laughs> well, I couldn't even say the word God for mm. years. It angered me um, but no. what's your feeling now in non-dual circles even now very often the word God isn't used much um, but how, what is your orientation to that word or that reality I find it doesn't appear much in my uh, relationship to the ineffable um, maybe I got that in a way sort of I'll say out of the way the idea of God um, and um, now for me the key words are things like awareness mm-hmm. which is a more less freighted it's a, it's clearer it's I, I recognize it as obviously not the thing itself but one of those words that's a little more transparent that you can see through it to the underlying perception mm-hmm. um, God to me, um, just because of the way I was raised, yeah. is freighted with all sorts of uh, conditions. 
stuff. But awareness, I mean, okay, let's let's start from the word awareness. How do we get daffodils and dolphins and galaxies and you know all the the marvelous sort of uh, uh, even the functioning of a single cell if you look at it closely enough and you see what an amazing thing is going on there where did how does that all arise from awareness I, if if awareness has the sort of plain vanilla connotation that it sometimes has yeah when i'm using the word awareness i mean all of that okay. i mean in what I will say is um, the unmanifest and the manifest mm -hmm. as one. Right. I would take as, for want of a word, um, awareness, um, love. Uh, love is a is a big operating principle for me mm -hmm. in terms of how my life finds expression. Mm -hmm. It just has to go. It has to be initiated from love, and it has to flow toward love. In other words, when I'm relating to life and my friends and people that I bump into on the street, there's there's just pretty much this love to love connection. Hmm. Reminds me of a Stevie Wonder song, Love is in Need of Love Today. <laughs> there you go. You yeah. know your songs. You I know? do, yeah. I'm an old uh, rock and roller. Yes, um, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for you then, awareness is not, not plain vanilla. It's not sort of this flat, featureless thing or non-thing. It, it's rich with qualities of love and perhaps we could say intelligence and yeah. creativity and you know yeah. it's sort of the repository of all potentiality that that we find expressing itself as this incredible you know diverse universe. Would you say that? Oh yes, yes and and again way way beyond what, what we can ever say about it but um, somewhere along the line with the awareness I, I came, I think some in one of my readings or something, I read for a couple hours every day, or at least I have historically, seems to be tapering off because other things are starting to happen. Mm -hmm. But in any case, um, affectionate awareness. Yeah. It, it, awareness by itself seems sterile and clinical and, you know, objective and no involvement here or something yeah like the flat white movie screen with you know exactly right yeah and and no it's not my experience if you will of awareness is is maybe it's just my manifestation the way it's happened for me mm -hmm. but affectionate awareness um it's one and the same affection and awareness mm. brought together um and that's you know, another say, another way of saying love. Nice. And, and I write a lot about love, uh, mm -hmm. or at least it seems to happen that way. I, I never know what I'm going to write, if I'm going to write in a given time, and then I'm feeling, I, I'm sort of moved to write something, and I, it happens. It literally happens. Do you find that that's blossoming more and more? Like when you first had that awakening in 2006, yeah. you know, that was like the start in a way and then did you find that over the last you know whatever it's been seven years or eight years there's been a, a kind of a more of a blossoming of blossoming of the heart and a welling up of love in your experience oh yes definitely yeah. <clears throat> and and in surprising ways and um, again I'm not it's just a continuous movement and how it's going to take form is curious to me in a given time in a given experience I um, I can be walking along and have the most again profound exchange with a homeless person or an executive or you know the range of people mm -hmm. um, and and there's this Communion. There's communion with people. Uh, it not, not necessarily even an aware one from their perspective, but we we both are touched and are touched. 
Hmm. You know. My wife and I saw a nice movie last night called Liberal Arts, which you might enjoy. And uh, there was one scene in the movie where this young girl turns this guy on to classical music, and which he'd never really listened to before. And so he's walking around the streets of New York listening to Beethoven and stuff. And, and, he's, and it, it changes his whole perspective such that everybody he encounters, he feels like it's someone he could be in love with. You know, everyone just has this beaming, friendly, beautiful look on their face just from his awakening to that kind of more... A deeper appreciation. Yes, yes. That's that's my daily experience. I would mm. say, um, and 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 it isn't articulated like we're you know talking about it. We might talk about oh I don't know. Usually it's something that's actually going on. In other words, I don't get into discussions about the past very much. Mm -hmm. I don't find it interesting. Right. And I don't get into discussions about the future very much for the same reason. It just doesn't seem to hold my attention very long. Mm -hmm. So we usually just go right where we're at, as, as, the, uh, yeah. as uh, they say in the South, and I still find it an awkward thing to say, uh, you know, uh, 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 stay where you're at or something like that. <laughs> you know, that expression? Oh, well, I'm doing some, where you're at? There's an old hippie expression, you know, he, know, he, uh, he knows where it's at. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, it's lovely there. Do you find that your experience of love um, seems to, maybe a synonym might be, just does it sort of spring from an inner joy? Like there's this just sort of blissful inner joyfulness, and that somehow manifests as love in your in your relationships. It's like you know, you're at the checkout counter at the supermarket or something, and there's such an inner joy that somehow it. It, it filters through as love for the checkout person. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and it, it just happens. And and you are very aware that there's there's a hollow. There's no James in the terms of an egoic love. It all the love that I ever thought uh, thought was love was was coming from my ego, and it was manipulative and. It wanted something. It had a codependency, a condition, and that. And there's just none of that. It's just kind of like a radiant thing that just goes out, and it doesn't need to have any uh, feedback. Even it's nice when it happens, of course, but right. it just emits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you said like earlier, a bird singing. like a bird singing, or like a light shining. You said before, you use the word light. You know, it's just on twenty-four-seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just there, and and you recognize, as everybody says, who's you know when they've had this experience. I I, I use the word experience very. It, it's not a sensual or a mental experience, which is what we consider to be our experience. You know, I call that experiences of the six senses. I combine the mind with the five senses mm -hmm. in my discussions with people. To kind of get the the recognition that the physical and the mental are um, expressions of reality, but they're not the whole picture. They're just limited. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful, absolutely essential yeah. function on the planet and in time and space. But uh, to be bound up solely in them as this is who I am, right, and this is what you are, and that is for me to limit myself and to limit you in the mm -hmm. same process, you know. Yeah. So we re we uh, we free each other a little bit more. As day. I'm as I'm looking at you on Skype, my background picture on my monitor is a, a galaxy. And uh, you know, I always look at galaxies, and I like to imagine all the trillions of life forms that might you know dwell in those galaxies. And you know, I think of them as, and, and yet you know, permeating all that is the oneness, the wholeness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, we're just one of those little life, life forms uh, in terms of our physical structure that you just alluded to, the mind and the body and so on, the senses. Mm -hmm. But it's like just a, the tiniest of peepholes through which that you know wholeness. 
experiences the material world and you know I, I, but as you say most people are kind of caught up in the notion that that's all they are <laughs> yes, yeah it's it, and and beautiful as it is and and mysterious i mean what do we know about any of this right you know we have a lot of ideas about it and i i use the example of of a frog being dissected and being understood botanically et etymologically uh all the kinds of ways and sciences that they can understand the frog mm. but really what do we know about a frog yeah try putting it back together again exactly exactly, <laughs> exactly. and so you know we take our um we take our identity and our our um meaning and our purpose and everything from um, um, a body mind based sense of reality and all sort of well and good because yes we do have a, an instinct to survive and and indeed prosper but um it's just limited and and uh, there's so much more um in the in the uh actual and in the real Mm -hmm. That's another area that I talk about a lot too. I think is reality. What do you say about it? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> what do I say about reality? Well, of course, you can only say about reality, right. and, and so words. Um, I'm often putting caveats in there, like you know, words are just words. Yeah, ideas are just um, conceptual framework for something that exists outside of the concept. Um, I point toward perceptions as perhaps something as a word, again, as a limited word, but that might help us penetrate a little more deeply into the stuff of our being. Mm -hmm. um, Reality I can I can use words like nature, like our natural well being is is founded in reality. Our joy, our our vitality, all our um all the Beingness. I I go for words here because we're in. The, I'm trying to describe something that is totally indescribable, and being is uh, is this one of the words that gets a little closer. Yeah. Um, well, ordinarily I, I wouldn't. Come back to that too a little more. If you yeah. Want. I mean, ordinarily I wouldn't ask somebody. Well, describe reality, but you said you talked about it a lot, so I, you kind of set yourself up I, for that one. I <laughs> did, didn't I? And I do. I I mean I'm. I'm I, I do talk around it. I right. discover it. I discover what it is moment to moment. And yeah. so it's not anything I can say, here's reality, there's reality. It's just a discovering right now, moment to moment. Mm -hmm. And it's not a description of it. it there's no, you know... Uh, describing of it in terms of uh, material content in reality. Reality has its own power, its own existence, its its gravitas. Mm -hmm. I like that word, gravitas. That kind of. There's a verse from the Gita that says, uh, "The unreal has no being; the real never ceases to be." Yeah, the, fi the final truth about them both has been known by the no knowers of reality. But um, I, I was kind of reminded of the old analogy of the ocean and the fish. You know, I mean, you ask fish, well, tell us about the ocean. And most fish are going to say, what ocean? I don't know about any ocean. And then some fish, a minority, are going to say, I'm looking for it, man. I'll tell you about it when I find it. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. And then yeah. even a smaller subset of fish are, are going to say, well, basically I am the ocean and this little fish thing is just kind of moving around in it as a you know a point of perspective but it's it's only a point you know and the the, the reality of the ocean is vast and all encompassing yes 
Yes, indeed. Yes, and and we we go silent, Rick. We go silent when we when we're when we really. In, I mean, it's all sacred. Um, and any time we approach the sacred, we 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 must somehow collapse into silence. Mm. At least that's my more and more abiding uh, relationship to to reality. It's it's something. It's an indwelling. I like that phrase, an indwelling. Um, that's indescribable. Somebody I heard I was listening to a recording this week of a, a Buddhist teacher, and she was talking the story about these two Buddhist monks that met and in their garden, and they they just sat together for about three or four hours or something, just sitting, you know. And finally, after three hours or so, one of them pointed to a tree and said, "They call that a tree," you know. <laughs> and then they both just burst into laughter. <laughs> mm-hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. Yes, I, I, I think those are the most profound times many of us recognize when, when really not anything special or whatever was said, but that we just simply resided in um, our awareness. Mm. And there was this resting in awareness, as Aja calls it. Um, and it, it becomes, I don't say a refuge, but it's it's the constant in a an aware living. It's there's always a resting in awareness. Mm-hmm. Whether or not, yeah, the the ocean is always the ocean. Whether or not it rises in waves, sometimes there's waves, sometimes there's no waves, but the ocean is there. Yes, yes, and and I I'm surprised sometimes. Even this morning, just with my little, I had a little confusion about the time we were uh, Central Time, Pacific Time, etc. And um, so I had very little time to to get ready for this interview, but there was nothing to get ready. Right. I mean, you know, and and so while while some egoic thing was saying, well, you know, you need to be able to sit and read quietly, and maybe sit in the garden, and you know, all of the kinds of things that maybe in a in some kind of a speculative way one might want to do. Um, but that isn't the way it happened. The recognition, though, is is that that inner peace, that core of our being, it's not disturbed at all. It's just. I think you've done your homework. <laughs> well, you know, it's yes, that's a good way to put it. But there is nothing to do, but be. Yeah. But you've lived a life which has enlivened the ground of being, you know, so that you're not just sort of tossed about in the winds. Uh, you're, 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 you know, established in being. Mm-hmm. There's a, a verse, another verse in the Gita. It's uh, basically yoga sta kuru karmani, it's, it's, uh, which, which is established in yoga or established in being, mm-hmm. perform action. Right. You know, but yeah. you know most people are just not established, and so they're just performing action, performing action, and it's kind of like it's all this agitation without any kind of foundation to it. Yes, yes, I, I, I'm coming to see um, uh, reaction coming from programming, from conditioning. I see that um, going on, but what sees it is not involved in it in terms of. Uh, attached to it or attached to an outcome or mm-hmm. so there's this simultaneity I, I sometimes say to people it's, it's like my mind is like a TV set that's on in the corner mm-hmm. right and, and um, or a dog curled up in the corner that uh, depending on but there's a watching there's just a simple watching Right. That is um, non-judgmental, among other things, loving, and. Um, but it's not something you're doing, right? I mean, not you, at you, all. you're not like being on your toes. I better keep watching here. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just kind of a nothing could shake it kind of thing. That's right. It's effortless. It, yeah. It, it doesn't. It's happening. Right. It's not anything to do with a, a me or a James. Yeah. That would um, command it. 
See, now that's where practices get born sometimes, which can be actually a little uh, unnatural. You know, someone might, let's say you might describe your experience, well, there's just this watching, and, and people hear that and they think, oh, that's what I should do. Okay, I'm going to start watching. And, and then they make a practice out of it, and all day long they're doing what you used to do in, during those 22 years. I'd, oh, I've got to reach for the salt shaker, but oh, I better watch, you know. <laughs> there's this, there's this kind of like, you know, unsettledness. Oh yes, we had exercises, and and in fact, one time in the school, self-remembering, uh, the teacher was encouraging people to have these, you know, these little clickers that yeah. people coming in the door. Sure. If you remembered yourself, you bought you buy this clicker, uh -huh. and you click yourself, and and you know, you at the end of the day, you could see whether see you how many clicks you got. X two or three hundred or whatever. Wow. I mean, you can see how how anything we do takes us away from what we are. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, although it all seems to be what happens, so there's no need to, in any way, um, beat oneself up about yeah. those efforts. And for all I know, you know, people who did what you did, mm -hmm. uh, who are doing what you did, maybe that's you know leading them to the point where it will become uh, second nature and not, not anything you need to do. I mean, obviously that's true of a great many relative skills. You play enough tennis and after a while you just, you don't think, you just know how to do it, you know. So who knows, but it does seem to be a little unnatural and uh, to make a pre and you know what it is, it falls into the category of turning a, a description into a prescription. Someone describes their state and and that's mistaken as a prescription. People try to mimic it by doing all sorts of practices which kind of are reminiscent of what they've described, but it's, mm. it's far cry from the actual living of it as that person described it. Yes, I, I, it's, um, it happens that the key word there is happens. Right. And um, anything else outside of it, just I'll say grace, occurring in turn where one has this simple usually sudden for me sudden recognition of uh, existing of, mm. of being of, of uh, again I, I, I fall into the wordless so quickly yeah. because it, it's like impossible to describe and yet because it's so simple and so obvious and so real, how do we get words and, and descriptors and measurements? You know, this is why science can, as long as science doesn't get closer and, and start to connect with the non-dual, it's just going to stay in its own realm, just like the mind stays within the labyrinth of the mind. and. Um, we did that. I mean, this is a very intelligent school that I was in, very highly intellectual, lots of very well-educated people, very well-traveled, um, you know, just my kind of people, I thought, you know, right. gave my spiritual ego a real boost. I was, I was something noble. That's where the appeal was, mm -hmm. that it was, it appealed to a kind of, if you join and are a member of this fellowship, you have status, mm -hmm. and you have uh, you bring honor to your family. There's a lot of spiritual groups that feel that way. You know, ours is the best, and and, because, and my guru is the best, um, and yeah. you know, because I'm part of this group, I'm somehow the cream of humanity, and yeah. you know, <laughs> so there's dozens and dozens and dozens of groups in which the people feel the very same thing, and all these other people have kind of lost it to some extent. They don't really know what's going boy, on. But boy, boy, am I fortunate to be in the, you know, the, the in crowd. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and we judged, and I say judged, uh, everybody who was not as being life. We call that life, and you know, sort of like in deferential terms, life doesn't understand, life doesn't have the breaks we do. We got a little buzz going on. I don't know whether it's my wife is running the blender. She forgot to close oh. the door. We'll just have to go. <laughs> this is life at home. This is life beautiful. going on. Yeah, yes. no, that's beautiful. Dogs oh. blender. It's all good.
Okay. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Uh, There's one thing I wanted to discuss with you, which uh, just came up this week, and I thought, well, I'll just talk about this with James, because I think we'll get some some uh, s- juice out of it. Um, and th- that is that um, I, I get a certain amount of flack, and I got some this week from people on the BatGap chat group, for talking about levels and stages and progress and, and things like that. And um, I'll just set this up for you and see what you say in response. But, you know, I mean, I can talk about the the sort of homogenous, indivisible totality of, of reality, uh, you know, with the best of them. But uh, within that, obviously, there is diversity. Somehow diversity is contained within the wholeness. And you know, if you want to, you can take any diverse thing and boil it down to wholeness, just as a physicist could take an apple and bring it down to the level of the unified field. But that doesn't sort of com- to completely negate or deny the existence of the apple. Um, so where I'm going with this is that uh, there's a kind of a paradoxical situation in which, on the one hand, yes, uh, there are no levels, there are no stages, there is no progress. You know, t- the, t- the the reality is that is what it is. It's c- completely all-encompassing, all-engulfing totality. But on the other hand, practically speaking, t- you know, paradoxically speaking, there's always this paradox. Uh, we do go through stages of development. We there there are levels. I mean, obviously, there physically speaking, there's the the gross obvious, there's the molecular, there's the atomic, there's the subatomic. There, there are sort of levels of nature's functioning, or at least there apparently are, are levels of nature's functioning. And so you can, in the same breath, say that there's no such thing as levels or progress or anything else, and yet say that there are. Um, and even in your experience, like that quote I wrote earlier about always read earlier about always going deeper and deeper, and you had a nice one from Rumi here in which he said, "Fall down and down in always widening rings of being." Um, so address that if you would. Well, um, it's it's a. a curious thing because we do live in paradox. We actually live in paradox. Um, and um, we want resolution. Something wants to kind of come to some conclusion, especially the mind always looking for conclusions. Although it being binary, it's totally unable to conclude anything. Um, so there is this diverse human experience. And then there's this um, even more diverse, I'll say, divine experience. And again, I'm using experience without... By when I say divine experience, I mean the timeless. Mm -hmm. And that isn't experience through the body-mind, but it is in some way recognized and and known. Let's say known. and maybe I could interject here and say it's known Please, by yeah. but known by virtue of the fact that there is a body mind you know it's like yes. this this you don't it's it's mysterious as you say but this although we don't experience it the way we experience you know books and desks and and light bulbs there is this sort of innate knowingness which seems to be made possible by the existence of a body mind let's just explore that a bit i i it does seem to be made possible in a sense that I can, in my six senses, um, uh, engage in in uh, this kind of life on, in time and space. Um, but I just wanted to sort of explore the idea that when we, when the body mind is no more, when that kind of death occurs that what remains is this same awareness. It's so there's not a condition. There's no conditions related to awareness in that sense. So what is immortal, what the unborn um, and the born, um, our unborn nature continues while our born nature will pass in time. and. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to... Yeah. 
Actually, I wrote down one of the sentences in your book. You said, death is the end of the dream called me and mine, you and yours. And you know, we, were, we started out this interview talking a bit about death, so maybe we'll come back to that. But um, I, um, I wanted to take exception to that a little bit because if, if the whole idea, like if you know, the Gita says here something like, as a man casting off worn out garments takes other new ones, so the dweller in the body casting off worn off bodies takes others that are new. I mean, if that's the way it works, uh, then I don't think merely dying frees one from the dream. Uh, it just perhaps you know, relegates you to a, a more subtle level of the dream for a while, and then you re-engage with a more concrete level of the dream once again until eventually you know, there's enough sort of uh, depth of realization that the dream is seen through once and for all. You know, that's um, uh, kind of the idea of karma, it seems to me. Um, karma, reincarnation, the whole deal. Yeah, and, and all I can understand about that is, is that, that that's an idea, mm -hmm. um, like, like everything that, you know, that we're wording. And, um, my, from, a, from an abiding aware perspective, It's an idea. I, I I really can't say that anything more about karma and reincarnation. I I do find that it could well be a um, a source of comfort that we have. Like uh, when I was being raised as a Christian, I became a born again Christian at one time when I was like fourteen. Um, and you know you would go to heaven if you accepted Jesus as your personal savior close quote and and so there was solace there even for a 14 year old and and as we get older we do tend to reach for uh, some kind of sense that what we are is going to go to heaven or continue um, it's there's a lot about it let me say that it goes into the realm of belief and what I understand about beliefs for myself is that they're just ideas in other words I don't have any beliefs I, I don't function I I don't need a belief um, in, in in fact I, I'm, I'm wanting to deal with facts with the actual and the factual, and belief gets in the way. It's it's a could be a wishful thing. Uh, even my beliefs are going to be conditioned. Well, yeah, but listen, um, if I mean the word belief just usually denotes uh, reference to something we haven't experienced. And if yeah. someone if someone said to you, "Do you believe in apples?" That would be an absurd question because, yeah, I've experienced apples. I eat apples. I know all about apples. You know, uh, so if someone says, "Do you believe in reincarnation?" We say, "Well, I don't know. It sounds like a, just a belief to me." But it, it actually, I mean, Adyashanti, when he has, has had his awakening, he remembered a whole lot of past lives. And uh, one of the standard cities in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is the yogi remembers all of his past lives, or a whole bunch of them, or, or something. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it can be a solace, I'm sure, and billions of Hindus take it as a solace. But it could also actually, possibly, uh, be the reality of the way the universe works. Um, it could be. It yeah, could it could be. be. I'm not insisting that it is, because uh, I certainly can't prove it. But, you know, actually researchers have done a lot of work on it and interviewed little kids that you know, remember the village they lived in and all the artifacts and, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. It hasn't been part of my spiritual path, you know. I, I never was attracted to India and a lot of the things. Um, and it seems um, it seems uh, useful for for a um, a non-dual perspective or from a non-dual perspective to recognize the mind and its limitations. And um, if I if I kind of see where something is coming from, 
and and then and recognize that it's limited and that I cannot know so many things. In fact, I don't need to know, and in fact, I'm quite happy to live in the unknown, mm-hmm. which is where we all live, actually. Um, you know, it's. I think karma is something that can be worked through, can be, well, in, in terms of waking up, uh, I think certain ones like Teresa of Avila, I can't quote these people so well right now. I used to know a lot more than I do now, frankly. <laughs> Honestly, I, I've lost a lot of what I've learned, mm-hmm. and, and I'm jettisoning, it seems. I, I wake up in the morning and something else is gone. Mm-hmm. But um, if we're raised as a monk, for instance, and we, and we quote, wake up, tend to see the figures of our Christian Culture. heritage. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and I don't know about Ajya, but, you know, I do know that he, he, he was a practicing Zen mm-hmm. uh, Buddhist for many years. And, and, and the, the nature of that does have a history, it seems, of seeing lifetimes. Uh, but, and, and it's all just interesting re- reporting of these things. And, it's pretty surprising and interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, the reason I find it interesting is that I, I, I don't think that a, um, you know, a, a deeper understanding or a deeper experience of the universe necessarily precludes a detailed understanding of it. And um, that one and that you know as you say in terms of you know this this quote i read earlier about deeper and deeper opening and and discovery of unknown realms and so on and so forth there's a whole world of possibilities out there uh, or in oh, there or, or in there as the case may be and um all these things which are which philosophers and spiritual people have been debating and speculating over for millennia um could be seen as sort of valid um, f- directions for exploration or theories which could be sort of scientifically in a spiritual sense you know, experientially explored and, and their truth or falsehood ascertained one mm-hmm. way or the other. So, you know, whether angels exist, whether reincarnation exists, all this stuff, um, I think it can be experientially known. And it may be icing on the cake. I mean, the real cake is this this living awareness that you've been referring to. But you know, no, nothing wrong with a little icing. If you, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And I I would. I'm not sure. What I can know is the false. I I feel like I can know that um, when it reveals itself to me as being false. Uh, but the truth, I get a little bit. I'm not able in any way to express it, although I know it. Right. And I don't feel like it's a coming to know. In other words, the truth is always of this moment, and it's always just here and simply revealing itself in obvious, very yeah. obvious. And, but what it is, that's the mystery. That's well, and you're re- you're referring to absolute truth here, you know, which is unmanifest yeah. and, and ineffable and just you know unexpressible yeah. in words. And the kind of things I'm alluding to in the last few minutes are relative truths. You know, yeah. if if there's reincarnation, if there are angelic beings, if all this stuff exists, those are relative truths. You mm-hmm. know, wh- which are ultimately unreal. I mean, I, oh. I acknowledge that they're ultimately made of the same stuff that everything is, which is pure being. So, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know. In a sense, nothing ever happened, nothing ever manifested. If we want to take it to that level, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah. we're living life, and and life involves all kinds of adventures and whatnot, which we can again, bo- again and again, as long, often as we want, we can boil it down to to pure nothingness. But we have to live life, and so, <laughs> and so if a good friend dies or something, 
you know, I can say, fine, it's all nothing, nothing ever happened. He was never born. He never died. Uh, right. But but it's also interesting to ponder, all right, on a, in a relative sense, uh, you know, as unreal as it ultimately may, may be, but it's relatively real. What happened to his soul? Is he going to be reborn? You know, where is he now? You know, and what does he know? What does he know now that he didn't know when he was alive? What is his experience? You know, that kind of stuff. It's it's kind of interesting. Maybe it's maybe it's a, some people would consider it a distraction, but um, mm -hmm. I find it interesting. Yeah, I am, and and I think I have, and I can find it interesting in a given situation. Mm -hmm. um, there's always some underlying knowing or recognition about the relativity of these things exactly and um, you know just that um, and that doesn't go away so one is one is always seeing uh, the world if you will and functioning in the world from that place um, and everything is relative to that place yeah in a, in a functional way mm -hmm. um, I agree with you all, yeah, all of these things exist, you know, in a yeah. certain kind of relative way. Yeah, so that's that's my basic perspective too, and and it's it's just that this absolute knowing doesn't negate all the relative knowings or all the relative, you know, explorations. It, you know, you don't say to your wife, "Well, we're not going to watch movies anymore or even talk to each other because it's all absolute and there's nothing." You, know, <laughs> you engage in the, those experiences. I, you know, it's so important to, to, to recognize that there is the human and the divine. Exactly. You know, and that they're fused. They're not separate. And, and we isolate ourselves from right. the divine, from our divinity, um, through the processes of the way we're raised and culturally and psychologically conditioned, etc. Mm -hmm. That isolation is, is a produced fabricated non-entity it never we never actually are separate mm -hmm. but we think we are and there's that lovely comedian um, Eddie Izzard who makes references to uh, he, he's going to be Napoleon in my head he goes <laughs> like this you know <laughs> you know and everything mm. is in my head <laughs> and, and but you know that's a good way to uh, to see how the mind, which is totally incapable of ever comprehending oneness, because in its nature, in its structure, its binary, it can only sort down to two, and it can never come to one, and one is everything. So the mind, putting it this way, the mind has no sharp as it is, etc., it has no actual direct way of knowing anything real. It can only know itself, its realm, the realm of the mind. Mm -hmm. And beautiful as that is, and thank God for it, it's, uh, we mess our divine nature if we reside 24-7 in our human nature. Yeah. There's a beautiful quote from Rumi. I'm just trying to find it here. Um, something about, um, maybe it'll come up, something about that we're not, uh, you know, a, a drop containing the ocean, or what we're, we're the ocean containing a drop, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, um, oh, here it comes. Uh, never mind, keep talking. Oh, well. Ah, uh, here it is. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in one drop. So you are the ocean, but living as a drop. And, uh, yeah. and there's this beautiful, there's this phrase that's repeated over and over again in the Rig Veda. But they they keep saying the absolute and the relative are, are interwoven, warp and woof. You know, if you yeah. if you know, if you know the way weaving works, like the threads I go do. one way and the threads go the other way. So that's the warp and the woof. But there's this sort of complete inter. Uh, Interpenetration. Yes, I'm in the tapestry business. Not to get into that, but oh, warp okay. and woof, uh, or warp and weft, um, are. Um, well, maybe that's the word weft. Weft is hmm. uh, well, woof. I think comes from an older phrase. I see. But, I see. But but um, yes, uh, it's a good way to look at life. And and if you think of the 
um, vertical threads, which are the, um, the the warp threads, which are the structural threads of a tapestry, mm -hmm. um, as them being the divine, and then the horizontal or weft threads are the ones that go through the horizontal or the the vertical, and they make up the picture. So mm -hmm. they could be considered to be the human are human, the manifestation of the divine. So their warp and weft are commingled um, and and together they produce um, the tapestry. The tapestry, life, uh, however we want to put it. That's nice. And, uh, and you know how you, were, you say you were a religious fundamentalist in your teens. You know, the people they seem to have a tendency to want to lock into a particular perspective and make it absolute. You know, there's some security in that. Definitely. You know, and it happens even in sort of so-called non-dual spiritual circles where, you know, people take this sort of absolute perspective largely based on understanding, in my estimation, not so much grounded in experience, and then kind of use that as a fundamentalist cudgel to, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to beat, beat people over the head with. Yeah, yeah, it's fear-based. I mean, ultimately, we have these deep fears, uh, existential fears. Mm -hmm. um, once we start to become somebody, that fear, that's the initiation of the fear. Before then, we have no fear because um, we know what we are. And, and, and that knowing, while it's not articulated, it, it has no qualities to it. To, and especially no fear. But yeah, we take on this uh, fear and then it goes from there. And we want certainty to assuage our, our fear, our doubts. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, somebody has said that the, the most fundamental believers are the most fear, fearful. You know, cause they're I think, you, I the think you've got something, yeah. I mean, and they're, def they're kind of like, Def desperately trying to defend their doubt, you know, or yeah. pr to protect their sort of because they're on very shaky ground, and they and, know it. Or either, yeah, some either they know it consciously. Yeah, at some level, they know it. I think there's a sort of an unconscious no you know, consciousness about it, but you know that, and the fear is externalized too. You know, it's it's definitely an inner fear, but it's externalized that we're afraid of this. You know threat over here to our integrity and that thing over there and everything is seen as a, a sort of a challenge because there's no foundation. There's a yeah. saying in the Upanishads that certainly all fear is born of duality. There you go. Yeah, I mean, right away, as soon as we enter the dual aspect of our nature, mm -hmm. solely, exclusively, with, you know, because that's the way it happens, we end up in a... Um, in um, uncertainty or wanting certainty um, we end up estranged from ourself in mm. some way and we don't even know what that is as we're saying it's it's a it's something very um, in our subconscious uh, but nonetheless it functions and it produces a life that's full of conflict you know how um, when the space shell comes in from outer space, yes. it um, as it's slowing down, it, it, there's a big boom as it as it breaks the sound barrier in the yeah. slowing direction, and yeah. then when something's getting faster, there's a big boom as it breaks the sound barrier in the speeding up direction, yeah. and it's like like that. You know, it's like a lot of people on the spiritual path when they get to the threshold of the absolute so to speak the, the, gate, the gatekeeper is fear so the fear is born of duality but on the return journey sometimes that same fear is encountered uh, and then cross, you know, in successful cases crossed over uh, and then one becomes fearless yeah I, I, you know uh, the, the idea of successful I would mm, just kind of park that a little bit because I don't feel in any way waking up is a success. Did I use the word uh, success? I guess. 
Yeah, you said yeah. successful, and oh, it doesn't matter. I, I'm yeah, just, just riffing along here. That's the word that came out. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and we're just having this lovely discussion. Um, it, it's sort of coming into our inheritance, mm -hmm. but we don't succeed at achieving it. That's the key word: achieving. And and all my ambitions, my spiritual ambitions, and. Even the idea of paths, while they all have their place, and I, you know, I had mine, you have yours, we all have the parent paths, apparent paths. Um, it turns out that we're really going nowhere, <laughs> and and have never left, and, and 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 it's functionally true. It's like, did we ever leave? In my head, right. You know, but but you know, and and well, anyway. Well, you know that T.S. Eliot quote. Didn't you quote it in your book at some point? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat it? No. It's That's there. Yeah, some it's, something yeah. about you know coming back to the place where from we which started. we started and knowing the place for the first time. Exactly. It's from exactly. Burnt Norton. Yeah, it's a great quote. Yeah, and and that in. I keep coming back to that because it doesn't go away. It's like that awareness of of never having left and and never having done anything and uh, the the inane ideas of past and future. Mm -hmm. I mean, inane. They just make no real. Um, I won't say sense at all, because in time and space, sensually, as we experience it, we do create and experience time and space. Yeah. Try booking a plane ticket without it. Exactly. <laughs> you have to. You have to function in time and space, and mm -hmm. and uh, I must say, it's taken me, and it's an ongoing thing, to learn, not learn to function, but in the moment. To see what the moment is asking for, mm. and that's nice. the the responsibility, the response ability mm. to the moment comes from uh, a recognition of what is asked for, so to speak. Yeah, um, and and so you never learn anything, you never acquire any. It's not like riding a bike where you learn your balance. Um, that in the world of time and space, we have to learn our functions, and all kinds of things. But in 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 uh, aware living, the functions continue, of course, and they must. But you never know. You never know what yeah. what you're going to do, and then. You find it's happening. I, I, it happens. We go for walks. I take my friends hiking and whatever, and or in the city, urban hiking sometimes. And the things that happen, and, and it happens with all of us if we're just kind of there. But you never know in these most beautiful opportunities of walking by, and you're admiring a garden, and somebody says, "Come on in and show you my garden," and you're, mm -hmm. you know, like, "Gosh." Here we go, you know, <laughs> and so yeah. kind of like wandering in this garden, you know. Um, I don't plan my day. I don't have a a plan um, for anything. I just it's not necessary except when it is to catch a plane. Yeah, but even if you lived a life in which a lot of planning was necessary, you know, you had a you were running a business and had all sorts of responsibilities and employees and taxes and all this other stuff, uh, that wouldn't preclude living in the moment or, or mm -hmm. you know, dwelling in in being or however we want to phrase it. Uh, it's just you know you, your particular relative expression is a little bit more footloose and fancy free than than some other ones might be. But uh -huh. I, whatever the lifestyle, I think this can be incorporated. This can be lived in the midst of it. Oh yes, oh yes. You could be a whatever brain surgeon and you know yeah whatever working under what I'll say all kinds of laws of time. seven forty seven pilot or something like yeah. that. You know yeah, yeah definitely. Sure. I, I've I've been fortunate and and blessed to have my own business 
uh, in terms of just this one aspect for 20 years um, and it's allowed me to attend to it minimally right? and to um, in my case pursue my spiritual uh, much more earnestly and fully I, I, I sort of a semi-monk for years you know I mean I was able to live that way and I needed that space and time yeah to 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 kind of collapse into my essence mm -hmm. um, and I mean who knows how these things work but my draw my while I didn't wasn't drawn to say meditation per se I could look at much of my life in the quiet shuffling around that it that occurred um, as rather monastic and yeah you know um, there could so be a place for that too I mean you know some people you know they say oh nobody needs to go off to a monastery uh, but literally speaking I think that can be of great value to people for whom it is, is appropriate you know there can be a time and a place for that kind of thing yeah. Um, and yeah. then there's a time and a place for coming out of it, perhaps. I mean, there's this fellow, Francis Bennett, whom I interviewed, and you may know him, but uh, I'm from the interview at least. But he, uh, he prompted me to um, write this. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and I met you anyway. I mean, I know you from the Sand That's Conference. Right. Yeah. Right. But um, you know, he was in a monastery for 30 years, various monasteries, and then he had this awakening, and and then at a certain point, he just felt this inner prompting. Okay, it's time for me to leave. Yeah. Um, you know, and now he's much more in the thick of things uh, in the world, but uh, with that foundation that you've been talking about. Yes, that's what seems to be happening now. Is is that um, um, there seems, seems to, while there was a contraction period, even after the 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 waking up part, there was some contraction and I would say residence in the absolute. That was absolutely beautiful, mm -hmm. and 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 I mean, not anything can be said about that other than we all know it. Um, and at a certain point, um, and it was thanks to Adju's help. He, I mean, I I did. We do need each other at points to point out things and say, oh well, this try this. This looks like that. And Adju was very helpful. Um, but uh, there's a moving out into life, mm -hmm. into complexity, um, but never the loss, as you say, of that ground of the absolute and the simple and the one. Right. And and it's curious to how that's happening. Like I, I, I've got some particular interesting things that are going on just in the last week that haven't occurred heretofore that seem to be saying, as Aja says, that if you rest in awareness, life will produce for itself whatever it needs. It looks yeah. after itself. You know, and, and it's we call it trust, some call it courage, but never knowing what's going to happen is a very real, beautiful, exquisite edge of one's being to be inhabiting. Makes it interesting, doesn't it? Oh, it's fresh, it's alive, it's vital. I think life gives you what you need even if you don't rest in awareness. But it, Definitely. But it can be a lot, the, 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 it can be a, a school of harder knocks <laughs> because there's no sort of, you know, there's no sort of anchor. And, well, we uh, need our suffering, don't we? I mean, yeah. I needed my suffering. I, you know, I needed all of it. I used every. Not now, I would say maybe I might be able to use it, use it, the suffering a little more because from some perspective, there's, I'm not engaged in it. In other words, I can have pain in my knee and not suffer it. Right. I, it, because I can just accept the pain. Mm -hmm. Instead of getting into a lot of imagination of yeah, it. oh poor me, oh, poor yeah. me, and you know get freighted with all that. So there's a more clarity in in terms of, I'll say there's a moment to moment transformation of suffering. That is only to say that there's a 
acknowledgement of what it is precisely that seems to be wanting to suggest that I should be worried or angry or create a problem over there in some way. One thing that comes to mind when you talk about the spontaneous unfolding of life um, and even pre- pre-awakening that, you know, that whatever happens is you know, meant to happen in some way. It's, it, to me, again, points to the, the intelligence of, of life and the, the kind of the evolutionary uh, direction that life takes. There's, there's this, it's like this river and, that we're all being carried along in to, toward, you know, I say I, great, I, the adjectives are kind of clunky, but greater and greater or higher and higher evolution, deeper and deeper, whatever you like. Uh, and, you know, some, some are swimming against the current. Oh, God, where is this taking me? Let me hold on to this stick. And, you know, and others are kind of flowing with it. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. it's it, you know, which, whichever way you do it, um, you're up against an invincible force, <laughs> which and you might as well yeah, flow with it. Yeah. Thankfully, reality is at least 51% and illusion could be the other 49%, mm. which is because illusion is extremely powerful, but reality yeah. is more powerful. Mm. And, and, and it's already won. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's already over there. Mm. Um, so it is all good. We can have all our illusions and, and suffer, illusory suffering and, and all of that. Fortunately, um, none of it gets real. Yeah, and that can seem rather glib, you know, if you're talking to a Holocaust survivor or a, a Sandy Hook parent or, or something like that, you know, but it, it does seem that the universe is a, it's a school of hard knocks. I mean, you know, it's not always going to be pretty. Asteroids crash into inhabited planets every day in this universe probably and everybody gets incinerated, but somehow in the big, big, big picture of things, it's all good. Oh and yeah, it's every, a, everything God does is for the best. It it is all good. It is all good, and mm. and you can see that in in, in a moment to moment way. Just just um, by tuning in, say to nature. Nature is immediately accessible because it is our nature. It's not mm-hmm. that nature outside. It's nature, nature, nature. You know, we're we're again everything is one and everything is intertwined. Nature is a wonderful teacher and, mm-hmm. and the illustrator of harmony, yeah. of, of a kind of innate peacefulness. I mean, now and then there's a you know a little cat fight, <laughs> so to speak, in nature, and and there's suffering comes from it, but it it spikes and then it goes back to a lovely kind of thing and then it spikes. Um, but that seems to be the nature of things to have some disharmony. Or imperfection amid greater perfection. Mm. Greater I'll tell you a little. Perfection. I'll tell you a little story that'll be kind of yeah. entertaining here. Uh, there was a king, and he had a, a chief minister who was his trusted advisor. And the minister was a very wise and philosophical man. And and just about any, anything that anybody brought to his attention, the minister would say, "Everything that God does is for the best." And this, this really annoyed some people. And there was one woman whose child died, and and the minister said, "Everyone." Everything that God does is for the best. So some kind of uh, tr- tricky people decided to trap the minister in this game. And so the king, one, they waited for their opportunity, and one day the king was having his manicure, and the, the barber cut his finger, cut the king's finger. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, it was bandaged. And so the, they, they went and ran off to the minister and said, hey, what do you think about this? The king's finger got cut. And the, the minister said, everything God does is for the best. So they ran back to the king and they said, hey, you know, your minister said that this was for the best, that you cut your finger. And the king got really mad. And he said, throw the rascal in jail. So uh-huh. they, threw, they threw the minister in jail. Then the king went off on a hunting party. Um, and while he was off on this hunting party uh, in the jungle, he got ca- he and his hunting his uh, companions got captured by some uh, aboriginals and they decided they were going to sacrifice this king they needed it they wanted to do a human sacrifice and so they were preparing him for the sacrifice and everything and they discovered oh he has this cut on his finger we can't sacrifice him he's not perfect you know we, he's not the right specimen so they let him go and the king was greatly relieved and uh, you know he went 
he immediately thought of his minister and he went rushing back and went to the jail and apologized profusely to the minister for having jailed him. And the minister said, no, no, he said, everything God does is for the best. If, if I hadn't been in jail, you would have, I would have gone with you on this party and they would have sacrificed me. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, there you go. Yes, yes, it's, it's, that's a lovely story. It illustrates something very, uh, very true to our experience. You know, and, and we can we can actually see all of this. Uh, there's a, a similar kind of story about a, a a man who has a horse and a son. Uh, well, actually, oh, the, oh, the oh yeah, that's a good one. Leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and they say, oh woe is me, uh, poor guy, he's broken his leg. But then along comes the uh, army, and they're recruiting. And the guy's got a broken leg, so he can't ride, and so he gets passed over. It's a longer story. Yeah, there's like four or five different segments. They're all, it's always the same. Yeah. And, the, and the, the old man keeps saying, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and <laughs> what he keeps saying, too, is, is um, you never know what's good or bad. Right. Yeah. I, as I recall in my memory in that. But, but that's so true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, if we take that phrase... Everything God does is for the best, and if we, if and, and if we understand that to mean that, you know, the universe again is one big evolution machine, uh, then all these dramas, all this stuff that keeps unfolding, uh, you know, that sometimes seems tragic and sometimes seems wonderful and so on and so forth, it's all part of this vast sort of cosmic unfolding, uh, and. Uh, you know, so it, it's just marvelous to contemplate, in my opinion. Yes, yes, and and if we can, if we can, I'll say, contemplate it from a from an absolute place, mm -hmm. uh, and we can, and we do, and we are. Uh, it's um, it's given context and um, meaning within the relative. There's 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 things that are. Um, that we're here to enjoy, or or to endure, or to experience in whatever way that that happens, um, and you know, where would we be without our suffering? We, we wouldn't be alive, frankly. We, mm. we couldn't have any experience in the body mind without uh, being born under gravity. <laughs> and you yeah. know, just breathing can be hard. You ever get sick with the pneumonia? Ah. And you realize just just the effort to breathe, you know, can be hard. And in fact, ultimately, gravity wins. <laughs> <It does. laughs> well, you know, Shakespeare said all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. And uh, you know, and if we were in, let's say, we we're in the play Julius Caesar, and and if we if we forgot that it was a play. And we thought that we were really Julius Caesar, and then it's like, oh God, all these people are coming to stab me. And if you were Brutus, you'd think, oh, I'm going to stab my my best friend here. And you know, the whole thing becomes very serious. Mm -hmm. But you know, but if you kind of can regain your memory that oh, it's just a play, then the whole thing actually becomes a lot lighter, more enjoyable. Well, and and there's nobody invested in the play. Right, That's right. The, you are literally the actor. Right. And so the acting that's going on is not me-centered. There, there's a selfless um, manifestation. Right. It, it comes from a selfless kind of place. And, uh, and if my character dies in this play, that's just the role it's playing. It's not the end. Oh, gosh, no. No, death, death becomes... At our elbow, you know. Um, uh, I studied Michel de Montaigne quite a bit at one time. One of the earliest essayists. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare in the 1550s, in the round there. And um, he was the first person to, we'll say, invent the essay. And mean to, meaning to essay something is to, um, it, well, like with gold, they'll essay gold to, the, to this date, the content, the makeup it. of it. Mm -hmm. So he he chose as his subject human nature, his human nature, his experience, and he followed it in long lines of friendship and all sorts of wonderful things. Michel de Montaigne's essays are a terrific introduction to our human nature and our divine uh, from 1550s. 
And why do you bring him up? Well, um, I've lost the track of why I brought him up. <laughs> we're talking about all, all we were talking about the play and you know getting getting lost in it and forgetting that one is merely a, an actor and you know versus real keep, keeping that memory and just enjoying the play and then then that somehow that um, stimulated you to bring his name up. Yeah, um, and you know it still doesn't particularly come back to me what the relevance <laughs> was <laughs> of Michelle de Montaigne. Maybe it'll come um, back. Just that with maybe something to do with the exploring of uh, of our life that, that it's it's a, a lovely opportunity that we have to explore all of these things mm. um, and, and to um, live them. To live, just to, to live. And, oh, I know what it was. It was connection to death. And, and uh -huh. up Michel de Montaigne, he talked about death being at his elbow. Mm. And he talked about he never left home, and he lived in a fort, kind of a fortified uh, place that I've been to. I've been to the tower where he wrote in, in, in France, in southern France. But he would leave home he would say goodbye to everybody as if he wasn't going to be coming back mm. and there were wars civil wars going on and, uh, and so it's a good chance he wouldn't come back there was a good chance the mortality then you know the, yeah. uh, the average lifespan he his his best friend had died um, with the plague etc uh, etc et so death was more of a constant and um, he introduced me to kind of because I've always sort of had a little curiosity about death, not mm. not in a morbid way, right? But but what is it? What what's true here? What's the truth of it? And I, uh, there's no fear whatsoever of death coming from and when you recognize your infinite nature. Mm. And it isn't like a feel good thing. It it isn't because if it stays just as yeah, that's nice to remember. That's good. That's that's it is a, a consolation, but it's a truth. It's yeah. a natural fact, and the fact of it is uh, where the juice is. Experientially, you're identifying with that which doesn't die. That's right. As that's opposed, right. instead of that which does. That's right. And and with that, um, and as Montaigne would say. You know, keep death at your elbow. <laughs> you know, it's useful. It's it, this. Everything is going to end as you body mind experience. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is finite. Yeah. Um, you know, Amma, the hugging saint. She always yeah. says. Uh, she says, "You never know. Your, your, your next breath may be your last." And she said, you, "We should live like a bird perched on a branch that might break at any time." And she too is not being morbid, you know. No. She, you no. know, yeah. It's not a morbid subject. It's a life-giving uh, subject to take anything really and go into it deeply. Any any profound uh, subject, say, and go into it deeply will lead you to life's essence. Um, but death is a particularly powerful um, trail. Yeah. Well, you know, I started this interview referring to my friends that died last weekend, and, and one of them, um, he, he knew he was dying. He, he had uh, hepatitis and his liver cancer, and, and he put up a few YouTube videos, which uh, were quite interesting, talking about his life, and he gave some talks here in town. And I went and visited with him, and and you know, a lot of people sort of gave him a lot of love. And then, after he died, um, you know, people were in he was, his body was laid in his apartment for a day or two, and and people were going there and just sitting or meditating or something. And I went and did that, and um, it was just this deep impression of of the fact that you know that which he was hadn't died, couldn't die. And uh, and the sense of the freedom. And again, I tend to be a little esoteric in this realm, but the sense of the freedom that he was now experiencing, uh, in contrast to you know the constraint he might have been experiencing before he died, and the pain that he might have identified with, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Somehow afterwards, just walking around looking at people, I, I kind of was seeing them as dead people who happened to still be animated. Yeah, that's you know a what I mean. Fact. 
Yeah, it's like there was right. a sort of a, uh, there was a sort of an inner spirit motivate you know mo- animating their bodies, but those yeah. bodies were as good as dead. And, we're and all, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's it's simultaneously so. You know, we're we're um, passing in time and space, and in and in experience, all of that is passing. It comes and it goes mm-hmm. until a point where it doesn't come or go. And what is left is that which does not come and go, which is actually the very spark of our nature. This yeah. thing that's right now visiting on on Skype, mm-hmm. uh, not to be limited there. The whole thing, right? You know, it's a, it's a, and, and it's so a universal that, fire. <laughs> yeah, and we have our song. We have our we strut and fret our our hour upon the stage, mm-hmm. and then are heard no more, mm. as Shakespeare said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, there's there's this great beauty, um, and all of a sudden the stock goes up. Our stock goes up in terms of our. We look at each other and our friends, and uh, after uh, somebody has passed, a good friend. Uh, um, we were with a, a man years ago, my wife and I, who we were with him very closely. I nursed him, and and until he died, and. Um, there's a great gift um, that he left us that, that was the beginning of another recognition and I'm, I know both Ella and I my wife um, were profoundly affected by not as much his life because we didn't know him much before that as his death mm. and uh, so not to be afraid of these things and not to um, um, feel that we need to um, build some kind of um, life continuing story mm. in our because it, our life it isn't a story this is not a story this does not need any um Consolations and and, and 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 good feelings about it. It's fine when they occur, but all I'm saying is is that it is all good. Yeah, it truly is all good, and life is just doing what it's doing, and I have nothing to do with it in any personal way. It's it's impersonal, very very intimate, the experience of it very very intimate, but it's quite impersonal. Um. And it's personal and enough. it's impersonal. Exactly. Yeah. The paradox, Rick. Yep. Same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's beautiful. Here's another Gita verse for you. Know that to be indeed indestructible by which all this is pervaded. None can work the destruction of this immutable being. There you go. Yeah. And we know this, and it's been known, and and we pass it on, and and you know, one day somebody will have heard Rick Archer say something, or. James Waite say something or all of it, but you know we're just in a way mimicking or ripples of 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 this original, actual, factual reality, mm-hmm. and we are the <laughs> instruments of it. Exactly, I was going to say that we're like we're like little sense organs of the infinite or little instruments of the in- infinite, mm-hmm. and um, each of us sort of. Doing our own little thing as a as an expression of that, and you know, I, I get the sense that I mean, if we want to anthropomorphize that for a minute, um, I get the sense that that being, that intelligence, really treasures and values uh, any of its expressions which have come to know it, and because it finds in them a an instrument which is willing and able. To um, to carry out its uh, its I say intentions again that it anthropomorphizes it to a great extent but it, it's sort of well will of God you know I mean there's so many sayings about the will of God Thy will be done and you know mm-hmm. make me make me an instrument of Thy peace the mm-hmm. prayer of Saint Francis and you know that's that's what's happening yeah yeah I there is 
there is something there, and I, I have no idea what it is, no idea what it is. Right. But it's in a in a as it as it manifests, there's a movement of love that wants to go out and um, release relieve suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something. There's that movement toward wherever pain is. Yeah, yeah. To 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 relieve that that suffering, and that's what I experience moment to moment, day to day. It's like the water flows in the direction of the slope. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And, and you so see you see that in the lives of great saints, you know, who are just like these powerful engines of of suffer of relieving suffering, you know, just sort of pouring their all into uh relieving suffering as best they can. Um right. Without and yet a, yet remaining, you know, in the bliss. Yes. So there's nothing uh, somebody said let nothing be a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Um and and uh, there's no big picture here. Or, or scale about wanting to do things on a certain way or along certain lines. I'm an ad guy. I'm a business corporate guy. I've had all this experience. It's all jettisoned. Yeah. It is of no use in the world in which this is operating now. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's um, the scheming, dreaming. No, it's spontaneous. You're just it's, doing doing your dharma, so to speak. You know, exactly. Spontaneously. Exactly, and it seems to be moving now. Um, just just recently, in the direction of of um, um, helping people relieve their suffering. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm not going to be a vehicle that's necessarily involved in helping people wake up. Or maybe you are, or both, or both. <laughs> it, it, do you know what I'm saying? It's just yeah, that at it's some like, time I felt like, oh well, I maybe I'll need to be a teacher or something. You know, teacher as in a, mm -hmm. a non-dual teacher, um, and that may, in fact, kind of has happened. But you know, I don't. What is happening now is is that I'm I'm maybe going to be moving into dealing with um, with people and easing some of the suffering. In their lives, without any discussion of you any, mean like in halfway period. houses or something like that. Yeah, that kind yeah. of thing, or this, this, um, this, um, um, this. There's a conceptual aspect here, and, and I'm calling it "be well," mm -hmm. and it's basically a um, a, a natural. <laughs> A way to help people come to their natural well-being. Maybe not, and but without using a spiritual term, but through love, but but not in the spiritual way, but just just that my my nature is to want to relieve suffering. Yeah, oh, it's great. I mean, look at Mother Teresa. She just spent her life tending to the poorest of the poor in, in the slums of Calcutta. You know, it's not like she was saying, hey, folks, I'm going to get you enlightened here. You know, she was just yeah. like, you know, washing their wounds and, you know, just yeah. making, making, doing their thing. But it was this beautiful spiritual example to the whole world. So uh, that, in, that, in, that was her role. In this case, um, the way the form it's taking, and again, this is just right now because I never know, but um, is with, say, boomers, couples. Mm -hmm. American boomers, there's like 77 million uh, boomers. Uh, I'm a boomer. I'm a boomer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 there's so much um, concern, uh, sickness, cancer. A lot of our friends have cancer. Sure. Um, you know, as as the boomers are kind of coming to the last chapter in their long lives, a lot of them have. You know, have not have arrived without much ability to kind of contextualize and 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 really get to the nitty gritty of of what their life is about. But they want to. They want to mm -hmm. explore it. And and so with this be well theme that seems to be emerging, 
Um, it's, gonna... a, it's a well-being. That's what I'm getting to, is, is that I'm more concerned, if you will, with the well-being of my fellow fellows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I'm not necessarily going to be in as direct um, awareness speak, uh, non-dual right. speak, more a broadening ripple out more into a... Uh, I think it's the nature of awareness. I see it with Eckhart Tolle, uh, Oprah interviewing him and you know, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. I see awareness is broadening and um, and love is finding new ways to move and penetrate. And, mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe the human species will survive through this vehicle. It seems pretty clear if, if something like a, a major awareness raising doesn't occur, I don't see any way that, that the current iteration of Homo sapiens is going to survive. I think that's the primary hope, you know. I mean, if as, I, as Einstein said, you don't solve problems at the same level of, you know, consciousness at which they were created <laughs> and oh. so there needs to be the introduction of a, a second element so to speak and yeah. uh, it yeah, seems to be it seems to be happening I'm optimistic the good news is that whatever is happening it's all good mm -hmm. and um, if if we as a species turn out to be a failed experiment well life will go on it sure will and and that's what we are is life. Yep. So so you know it's all good. <laughs> um, and and so uh, we'll see, won't we? But yeah. You know, Stay if, tuned. If we pass, spread the love, share the love the way we're doing it. And uh, again, I thank you and, and uh, appreciate it very much what you're doing. Oh, thank you, James. I you know I, I love doing it. And uh, speaking of our friend Francis, he'll be coming out to the Science and Non-Duality Conference with me in the fall, and maybe hopefully we'll make it down there. We can all get oh, together. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, to, to I haven't met Francis, and um, uh, for various reasons, I felt an affinity with him. Although he's spent you, you too. Well, a lot of people do. Yeah, it's yeah. like we we become really good friends. But um, he's yeah. in fact he's coming to my town this month to, for a visit. But um. Uh, he, he strikes a chord with people. Yeah, yeah. L a lot of the ex-Catholics really get off on him. <laughs> and, well, they're uh, good. Yeah. Because good. they're looking for that, which he now represents and, and embodies. Uh, you know, when you come through any major field of uh, religious endeavor and, and actually, you know, uh, embody the, the, the root yeah, although I think he would attribute it all, to a great extent to the Zen and Vipassana he practiced while he was in there for all those years. But you know, he did. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he he did decades of practice of that sort of thing within uh, the within Christian the monastery. monastery. Yeah, it was a very Christian. liberal sort of monastery he was in. Yeah. It was the same one that um, Merton. Thomas Merton was from. Yeah, so they they let him do that kind of thing. Anyway, we're kind of getting off on Francis. People can watch that interview if they yes. want his, his story. But uh, so let's let's wrap it up. This has been great. Um, really enjoyed talking to you. I I hope as usual that I haven't talked too much. Sometimes I get flack from people for doing that, but uh, I consider it a conversation, and I try to give the lion's share of the airtime to the guests. But some every now and then I like to put in my two cents. Well, uh, I think I think that's much appreciated by your viewers too. Rick. Yeah. Most most of them, I suppose. <laughs> Some people said, aren't you, will you shut up? <laughs> but anyway, um, so I've been talking with James Waite, and he has a website, which is... NonDualityLiving.com Dot com, NonDualityLiving, and I'll be linking to that also from BatGap.com, and I imagine they can participate and read what you're writing and get in touch with you if you want to, if they want to through there and all that stuff. Yes, right. I'm. I'm totally open to um, to Talking, what's next. Chat, chatting with to, people. If if someone has some sense of of wanting to do something or to 
in some way connect, please, yeah. I invite you to do so. Okay. You may find that you're invited to have Skype conversations with people like exactly. this. So you, know, you might want to be open to that if you want. I'm yeah. open to um, all of it. I have no um, idea particularly which way or in how one should be manifesting. I'm just... Uh, right. I just go from next to next. See how it flows. See how um, it so a uh, couple more concluding points. Um, this interview has been one in an ongoing series. There are 170-something of them now. So if you'd like to watch or listen to others, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump. Somebody asked me this week, what's the A for, the G-A-P? Well, it's part of gas, but you couldn't pronounce it if you left that out. It would be ga bat g so, <laughs> so I left the A in there so you could pronounce it. Oh, okay, now uh, we know. Yeah, and uh, there you'll also find a discussion group that crops up around each interview, usually with several hundred comments and, and whatnot. People get chatting about what has been discussed and other things. There's a general discussion group also for you know, discussions not necessarily related to the particular interview. There's a link to an audio podcast, which you, you can subscribe to in iTunes if you'd like to listen to this on an iPod while commuting or whatever. And there is a donate button, which I really appreciate people uh, clicking if they have the wherewithal. I just bought a um, camcorder with donations that had been sent in, which I intend to hook up to my computer here for better video quality and also to use for more live in-person interviews. And um, there is a little link there that you can click on to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. So I think that just about covers it. So thank you, James, and thanks to all who have been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Be well. Be well.